Hello and welcome to If You Love This Planet. This week my very special guest is actor Martin Sheen, best known for his performances in the films Badlands and Apocalypse Now and in the television series The West Wing from 1999 to 2006 for which he won a Golden Globe and two Screen Actors Guild Awards. In addition to film and television, Sheehan has become notable for his activism in liberal politics. He credits the Marianists at the University of Dayton as a major influence on his public activism. Sheehan is known for his robust support of liberal political causes such as opposition to United States military actions. Sheehan has resisted calls to run for office, saying... There's no way that I could be the president. You can't have a pacifist in the White House. I'm an actor. This is what I do for a living. Martin Sheehan is an honorary trustee of the Dayton International Peace Museum and he kindly joins us on the phone now from California. Uh, Hello, Martin Sheehan. Hello, (laughs) Helen. How are you? Oh, I'm pretty tired. How are you? Well, I'm not so bad. A uh, happy Easter to you. Oh, yeah, happy Easter to you, too. Did you have some Easter eggs? Well, uh, always. Yeah. They're a great delight. Yes, I love Easter eggs, and I love Easter because it's a time of renewal, isn't it? It really is, yeah. yeah. And I know for you it's very profound, being a, a, a deeply committed Catholic, uh, which is kind of how we first met, isn't it, Martin? Can you remember how we first met? Uh, well, I've known you for so long. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember not knowing you, Helen. Oh, go on. Well, how long? How long? It was here in the states. Yes. Am I right? Yes. I'll I'll tell you when it was. I think that I first met you was at Los Alamos Labs, where uh, on one of numerous pro- numerous protests, uh, you were there, and the police had set up a, an artificial line beyond which one must not move. And you went to the line uh, with other people and you knelt down and said the Hail Mary. You got up, walked across the line and they handcuffed you uh, (laughs) to take you to jail. But then you said you couldn't go to jail because you're already committed to to be president in the West Wing series. You had... (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's very close to... To the uh, the occasion at Los Alamos, I remember that very well. Yeah. Uh, Amy Goodman was there, incidentally, yeah. reporting on it. Yeah. And my dear friend and peacemaker, uh, Father uh, John Deere, was arrested with us as well. Mm. And uh, 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 young uh, Berrigan, uh, one of the uh, daughters Martin. of Philip Berrigan, oh, yeah. uh, was arrested with us as well. Oh, And Catholics. you had everything right except the prayer. Oh, I think was... it was an Our Father and not a Hail Mary. Ah, <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> oh, well, I can't always get things right. <laughs> well, we always say the Our Father uh, when we cross the line in these places. Yeah. And uh, usually they arrest us before we get to the line, forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive them that trespass against us. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. They're usually in handcuffs by then. And and do you think it helps to say the Our, Our Father when you're doing such an action? Well, it certainly helps me. You know, uh, I have to confess that I don't really have a great deal of interest in politics per se, mm. per se, mm. because I don't think that politicians. I'm not saying all public servants uh, servants are like this, but mm. politicians generally are meant to serve a, con- a certain constituency, and so that they're not always free uh, to vote with their conscience or act from their heart. So I, uh, while I have supported a lot of uh, uh, men and women who run for public office, mm. uh, I'm I, I I I don't really have the kind of faith that I have in grassroots movements, mm. which are born of the people and really make the change. There are very few great things that have ever been accomplished by uh, uh, politicians uh, in the beginning. They're usually, uh, it's brought to their attention to do something, mm. uh, but it's done by people like yourself who agitate and... Uh, and, educate. And, and, educate. And, 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 and educate, yes, yes. Yeah. Agitate and educate. Uh, people to what's going on, mm. and then hopefully you can get people in uh, positions of responsibility to do something about it. 
but I think in my own country in the you know in the '60s, the civil rights movement was not uh, was not a uh, a, 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 the the uh, the, the preve of uh, politicians. There mm. was no one in public life who initiated uh, the civil rights legislation mm. or any anything to do with civil rights. It was uh, Reverend King mm. and the nonviolent movement for mm. civil rights, the civil rights movement, you know. Mm. And he never held a polit- political office in his life. And it's the same for unionism, you yes. know. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the union started from the workers, the people who suffered the most at the hands of mm. uh, abusive uh, employers. Yeah, that's really how a decent society has grown up with with a decent minimum wage and rights for workers. Otherwise, though, it, it, it was virtually a feudalistic system in the eighteen hundreds and the, and the like until the unions yes, got it, together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes, it was, and the unions formed the middle class. Yeah, and the wealthy people never understand the importance of unionism. Mm. How how important it is for the majority of the people to be educated and to have a stake in the future mm. so that, that they have to have a, a wage and a working condition that, that, that their children can uh, benefit from their labor mm. well, and, you... and, and carry on the society. And, in fact, uh, you know, they, they still don't get it today, the importance of unionism. You move amongst... Uh probably very wealthy people uh, living where you live and the like. Martin, d- do you talk to them about this? What it, what, tell us what their attitude is at the moment about how particularly the American society is going. Well, I, you know, I don't, you know, frankly, I, 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 I moved in this neighborhood long before it became a, a desirable place to live. In fact, we moved to Malibu uh, uh, because it was the cheapest place to live at the time, you mm-hmm. know, back in, uh, in uh, in the early 1970s, and we've been here ever since. But uh, our primary concern was trying to find a, a big enough place for uh, our family mm. and uh, and a place that we could afford. So the the, the, the neighborhood grew out of proportion uh, uh, after we uh, moved in when mm. the land became so valuable, you know. Mm. Uh, otherwise, I could not have afforded it. But yeah. um, I, I don't really talk to a lot of wealthy people um, about uh, many of the issues that are going on in our culture because uh, I'm so involved in the issues myself. Mm. And um, you don't see a lot of wealthy people on picket lines or protest move, movements, yeah. you know. Uh, they usually have uh, a lot more at stake, you know. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I don't know that many wealthy people, frankly. Mm-hmm. And I don't have a lot of close relationships with them. So, um, I, I, and that's not by by choice per se. It's just the path that I have chosen to mm-hmm. go uh, does not attract a lot of wealthy people because sometimes uh, the path I go is uh, is very challenging and very costly. I'm asked uh, at times to to debate some of these extremists, these right wing people, mm-hmm. these Tea Party people, and the extreme far. Mm. right wing in my country, and I refuse to debate with them because they make a living doing what they're doing, and what I, what, what I do is costly. So I don't, uh, I don't like to feed into their, uh, you know, to their channel. Yeah, I know it gives me a pain in the neck because I don't earn any money for what I do either, and, and yet, yeah, well, anyway, that's beside the point. Do you do you still go to picket lines now? What what are your main oh, activities? Oh, I still do. Now? Yeah, you know, we're supporting this uh, the the union movement in the state of uh, Wisconsin. Wisconsin, and oh, then in good. my home state of Ohio. Oh, good. Where they have uh, you know blocked uh, uh, what what had been fought for for over fifty years. You mm-hmm. know, uh, 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 bargaining, and uh, uh, that's the, it's the. Uh, it seems to become. It seems now to be a, a national movement mm-hmm. to go after the unions and the union pensions and their right to collective bargaining. Uh, and and uh, it's a big mistake. And in fact, it's backfired in Wisconsin, and it's starting to turn around in Ohio. 
Well, what do we do about those fellows, the Koch brothers? I don't know how you pronounce their name, K-O-C-H. No, you got it, yeah. The uh, Koch brothers. They are the biggest polluters because they are the coal industry, yes. you know. Yes, yes. And uh, these guys got a lock on it, even in Congress, you know, the people that they have supported and sent to Congress. And then a lot of the people that are on the committees that would uh, have a say in uh, EPA regulations and so forth and regulations of uh, – of uh, the pollutants, you know, coal is the biggest polluter on the planet. Oh, I know, except for nuclear power, Martin. Nuclear power, yes, of course, is the is the worst and the the deadliest. Mm. It, it's it's quicker, you know, it'll it'll kill you quicker than coal. But coal is, is you know, oh. future generations are going to be affected by it in in a in, in a in a much uh, deadly in, in the same kind of deadly health ways, you know. I know it's it's. Global warming is upon us, and random compulsory genetic engineering for the rest of time is upon us from yeah. the whole of the nuclear activities. And, uh, well, I, I did an interview this morning, actually, um, in Southern California, and uh, I really said, I quoted Einstein and said, he said, the splitting of the atom changed everything save man's mode of thinking. Thus, we yeah. drift mm -hmm. towards unparalleled catastrophe. And I said the profundity of that statement has really, really never been taken on board. And really, Martin, I think it's much up to the women now. 53% of the population is women. Yeah. And we need to harness the, the, the passion that a lioness has to protect her cubs. Yeah. And remember the Saturday Evening Post cartoon, which used to say, an aroused woman is unstoppable. Yes, <laughs> I think, and I believe it. Yeah, yeah. We've, we've got to arouse the women to take over. I mean, we, we really need a revolution now of, of Gandhian proportions. I quite agree. And, you know, uh, uh, Dostoevsky said the world will be saved by beauty. He meant women. Did he? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very clearly, yes. <laughs> That's lovely. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, we had a revolution in the 80s, Martin. That was, I, I believe, the second American revolution. When I yes. first came to America in 78 to live, um, almost everyone said to me, it's better to be dead than red. And I said, what, you'd, you'd rather die in a nuclear war? Oh, yeah, we don't want to be communist. So then, <laughs> <laughs> so then I got together 23,000 doctors and we started dropping the bomb on various major U.S. cities and vaporizing everyone. And within five years, 80% of the Americans rose up and said, we will not put up with this, um, we need to get rid of nuclear weapons. Now, it was partly helped by Pat Kingsley. Do you know Pat Kingsley, uh, the agent in Hollywood? Mm, I've heard uh, but uh, of her, but I don't yeah. know her first. She represented Lily Tomlin, Sally Field, and all of these wonderful people. Well, she used to ring up to the Today Show and say, look, or, or Donahue, and say, I'll give you Lily Tomlin and Sally Field if you'll have Helen Caldicott on too for an hour. And they didn't want a boring old Australian doctor talking about <laughs> nuclear war. I mean, that's bad for ratings. <laughs> they can't sell their hemorrhoid cream if they're, you know, talking about nuclear war. But they loved having Sally and Lily. And she did it all over the country. And through that, we were able to educate the majority of Americans about the medical dangers of nuclear war. I mean, yes. you've got to have access to the media, and it's damn hard now, isn't it? Yes, it is, and now it's even more so. But, you know, there are uh, many uh, new uh, venues, you know, uh, with the uh, cable TV and yeah. uh, satellite uh, radio and such. You know, there are so many uh, opportunities now to get a message heard and get get a message mm. seen these days that we didn't have before. But, of course, there's so many more of us. That's right. You know, and so, they, you know, the message is that much more urgent these days. Oh. And we don't have to look far. Look at, uh, in Japan, uh, mm. this horrible catastrophe. And you know what's uh, extraordinary? It's already off not just the, the, the front pages, but it's off the back pages. There's nothing in this morning's paper, and there hasn't been anything in the, in, in the Los Angeles Times within the last week that I can uh, remember about the catastrophe in Japan, the nuclear catastrophe. Mm. Uh, and that's just a civilian uh, 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 catastrophic uh, emergency, and it's still going on. 
Yeah. And uh, I don't even think the people in Japan are as well informed as they need to be about what's going on uh, in that uh, complex. Oh, no, there's a big cover-up, absolutely, globally, uh, by the nuclear industry in Japan. And, and incidentally, isn't this the 25th anniversary of yes. Chernobyl? Yes. I, I, this very day. I just know yesterday. Was it yesterday? Or okay. the day before. I just taped a week ago in London a CNN international debate with three people from cor- the corporate world, HSBC Bank and someone else. Do you know they were talking about profits in the market? And I said, and we were discussing Chernobyl. And I said, are we going to kill the earth for money? That's where their heads are, Martin. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. To go back, you know, you did have a wonderful president in our lifetimes, and that was FDR. Yes. And we had a few good tries since then and a few mm. good men and in, in, in some areas, you know, mm. that uh, made some extraordinary changes in, in my lifetime. Yeah. Well, okay, so you were once president, and we absolutely adored you. Everyone <laughs> was addicted to you. <laughs> I was known uh, affectionately as the acting president, yeah. and now yeah. I'm known as the former acting president. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you know who I loved was Mrs. Who was your secretary got killed in a car crash? Mrs. Mrs. Landingham. Wasn't she gorgeous? Oh, I adored her. She's now a big star on uh, a Housewives, uh, oh. a Desperate Housewives. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. And that she was your mentor at school in the, in the, yeah. in the, in the play. Well, yeah. I'm going to ask you a fairly serious question now, and you don't have to answer it, Martin Sheehan, uh, but I want you to give your assessment of uh, President Obama. Well, the fact that he's there is a testament to our... Uh, willingness to change, and uh, as a nation, as a culture, Mm -hmm. it was an unprecedented step that he was elected and uh, is such, and is so revered. Mm. Uh, I have, you know, a lot of reservations, which uh, I find hard to talk about publicly because I don't want to sound like I don't support him. Mm. I do support him. And uh, and give thanks and praise to, to God every day that he's there and that he, he hopefully will be there for another term uh, uh, from, uh, you know, from uh, 2012 on. Uh, so that said, there are, of course, uh, many issues that I'm uncomfortable with mm. um, that I, I wish that he move more quickly uh, to become involved in, you know, one of the main issues that I'm involved in is the immigration issue here, how uh, disaster a policy the federal government has on immigration currently, and and the debate seems to have been stifled. And he, uh, during the campaign, was very forthright about acknowledging the uh, problem and promising to fix it. And there's been very, very little movement on that. But Again, that being said, uh, he he's working with a Congress and a very very conservative media, on the whole, uh, that stifles so much of his uh, uh, his uh, weight and so so many of his initiatives are not implemented, uh, and he he's you know he he finds himself in these trench fights just over health care, for example, which took up almost a full year of his uh, administration and with the constant uh, 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 battles over, you know, the implementation of, the, of, a, of a, a badly needed health reform. Mm. And they're still battling on it. And some of it is even going to court uh, because there's such a, um, a, a profit margin in the pharmaceuticals and the health care system and the hospitals and the, uh, the, the, medical, the whole medical profession. Uh, not the least of which are the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the the pharmaceutical companies. That there's so much at stake, and uh, so a lot of his time and energy and focus has been uh, has been spent trying to get these incremental changes through in a very hard-nosed uh, Congress. 
but not just there, but in the culture itself. So much of his health care uh, legislation was tarnished in the media, you know, the right-wing media uh, and the conservative media, to such an extent that uh, uh, it, it made it impossible to understand what really was at stake. You know, he was trying to foster a health care that was affordable to uh, all Americans, uh, all of our citizens. And, uh, you know, just that one issue alone. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, you could go on and on, and we're never going to be satisfied with the whole picture, no matter who's president. Even the most ideal president is going to give us uh, pause in so many areas. But for me, uh, the health care, the immigration issue, of course, the nuclear issue, uh, and, um, you know, the, the big oil, you know, now they're screaming they need to drill, and uh, they're going to get pretty much uh, what they want because of the uh, the gasoline prices now and the oil crises. Uh, they're told we're told now that uh, we need to drill and and be become less dependent on you know foreign uh, uh, you know the, the foreign foreign oil. So, uh, gosh, there's any number of uh, issues that you could find fault with his. Uh, administration, I, and I'm certainly uh, uh, not blind to that. But I, you know, what I keep saying to people who complain about him, I say, you know, the first thing we have to accept that he's not them. You know, we just went through eight years uh, with them, and, you know, Mr. Bush <laughs> and that group, you mm -hmm. know, uh, mm -hmm. that wanted the, uh, you know, that pretty much had their sway since 9/11 in every area mm. and made a mess of it, as we know, and we're still trying to clean mm. up much of that. Mm. So he's not them, thank God. And um, on many issues and many um, uh, uh, promises he has delivered, and uh, we're just learning how difficult it is, even in that most powerful of physicians, to make the slightest uh, incremental mm. change uh, and lead a whole culture in a new direction. And our, and our nuclearism, of course, is part of that. But he can't even get the, the, uh, the treaty, you know, with nuclear uh, weapons reduction that he did with uh, Russia. He, he, that has not been uh, confirmed yet by oh, the Oh, it's Senate. not been ratified? I thought, I thought it was ratified, except Senator Kyle didn't vote for it. C certain portions of it have, oh. but the whole thing about... Uh, um, allowing um, uh, for inspections, yeah. you know, that's still a very touchy issue here. It's a very nationalistic issue, you know, and it is for the Russians too, I guess. Oh, let's uh, But them. you know, we're one of seven uh, nuclear nations, and uh, you know, if you look at the Middle East and uh, or, or you look at uh, Asia and you look at India and Pakistan alone, these are two nuclear armed nations that are constantly at each other's throat, and they live on the same border. Uh, you know, and we, we supply an awful lot of help and a, and a lot of uh, 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 revenue and a lot of uh, uh, aid to those, both of those countries. And, if I, you know, if I was to uh, have my uh, wish granted one of, for that whole region is I would... I would uh, uh, tell both countries that until they disarm, uh, nuclear disarm completely, that I would have no trade with them, and I would sanction both of them. I'm interviewing the former president, Martin Sheehan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the former acting president. No, yeah. no, no, no. Um, I, I agree with that, but, you know, of the 25,000 or so nuclear weapons in the world, Russia and America own 97% of them. Yeah. No, and they're the real rogue states. They're the real axis of evil, holding the world at ransom every single second of every single day when we could have a global nuclear war and the end of all life on the planet. Um, that still holds true as it did during the Cold War. Nothing's changed. So... Therefore, it would be hypocritical and as seen as such by many other nuclear nations for America to say, OK, you're not getting anything anywhere unless you get rid of your nuclear weapons um, when America has the majority of nuclear weapons actually of any nation in the world. That's true. And, and, the, and the delivery system. Yeah. 
yep. as well that can send them just about anywhere in the world. Oh, 6,000 miles in 20 minutes. And yes, exactly. You know, and I, with I, the, the, I, the nuclear capability of submarines as well. So, yes. And you know, I, they can move them around. I okay. read yesterday that in the Dakotas, where many of the silos are, with with a single minute man three missile with three huge hydrogen bombs in it, um, and you, you can see when you fly over the Dakotas north and south, you can look down and see these missile silos um, uh, scattered all over the place, hundreds of them. But there's been snow mu so much snow this year and it's now melting and starting to flood the missile silos. Uh -huh. And I think to myself, well, that's a good idea. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> they want to make Except sure... That you could have a meltdown in the silo. Well, No. No, you couldn't. No, you just, as we'd say in Australia, bugger up the mechanism to launch the missile, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, no, this is true, but they, they are, uh, you know, they are armed. Oh, I know. Three huge hydrogen bombs, each targeted specifically and accurately yeah. on three different targets. I mean, it's... Yeah, and well, we, the we, MX-12 is, is the 12, you know. But they, yeah, I know. But did they? They didn't build the MX. They were going to, but didn't they cancel it, Martin? No, they, that that is a you know a, a delivery system that was high was a big priority mm. during the Cold War. Yeah, and it's not you know it's not uh, so much uh, uh, it doesn't feel necessary for our defense these oh, days. Defense, I hate that word defense. I mean, yeah. I've renamed the Department of defense the department of death because yeah. mm -hmm. that you 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 people over there spend or more than one trillion dollars a year on death that's true yeah, and, yeah i know it's more than that oh, yeah. it's just yeah unbelievable and you know as a doctor myself working at harvard with patients dying of cystic fibrosis do you know in the 70s and 80s parents couldn't afford antibiotics for their dying children and I come from a country which is basically socialistic, which is what Jesus was. He, he was a socialist, you know. Yes, he was. More yes. difficult for a rich man to community enter. Community organizer. Uh, more difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. And yes. I just, and we've got a totally free health care system. And I, I can't, the American people have been so brainwashed to think that that's, you know, a form of communism or some absolute rhubarb, whereas yeah. you've got a socialistic death system. Yes. Uh -huh. mm. Well, this whole, uh, you know, paranoia about our our own uh, our own security. Yeah. That's that's another word that uh, security. Uh, it's yeah, to is, do is with bandied it. about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You you're insecure totally when the Russians are still targeting you with thousands of hydrogen bombs, which, you know, there are forty H bombs targeted on New York, Martin, and about sixty on Washington as we speak. Yeah. 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 I didn't know it was so many. It wouldn't take that. Many. Somebody ought to tell them it wouldn't take that many. Why? Why don't you get rid of it? At least at least thirty nine. Well, because they built so many and there's such a redundancy that they just over-target things, and so does America. You know, it's yeah, sort of no, it's true. Well, you know, uh, it's it's part of our, uh, our 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 economy as well. You know, we support yes. the whole uh, military-industrial complex. You know, and uh, that that's really where most of our eggs are stored. Our our whole economy is based in large measure on. Uh, uh, related industries, you know, to the defense industry. Well, it's not defense. I we, we mustn't use that word defense anymore. It's a euphemism. It's like we had to destroy the village to save it, that sort of euphemistic language. Um, it's not defense. It's killing. It's death. It's destruction. Martin, uh, I want to ask you what... What stimulated you in the first place to become so deeply involved in social issues correlated with your deep, deep religious feelings and beliefs? Well, uh, as you may know, I'm a Catholic, a practicing Catholic. Uh, I returned to the church after a long absence uh, in 1981. Uh, uh, in May of that year, I was in Paris. I'd gone through some... Uh, deeply transforming uh, personal 
uh, things, and I came out at the other end realizing that I needed to get uh, involved in uh, in a uh, in a spirituality, and so I rejoined the Catholic Church. But I didn't come back to the faith of my childhood, where I just uh, did everything that I was told and and lived mostly in fear and dread. You yeah, know, I came back to the radical. Uh, Action Church uh, of Liberation Theology, and in the United States, I became close to the Berrigan brothers, both Dan and Philip Berrigan, and uh, they began to uh, lead me in the way of radical action. Uh, Radical meaning root. It's the, you know, the Latin word for root, and it's how the church started, and so uh, it is a, a road of uh, social justice. You know, the Old Testament calls for us to, uh, to do uh, justice, to love greatly, and to walk humbly. And so that's kind of been my, uh, my focus. And I have come to all of the issues that I'm involved with, all of the social justice issues, including nuclearism. Uh, on the uh, level of, of spirituality. And so that, you know, I, I, the bottom line is I don't get involved uh, in protests or any of the actions that I do with the, the belief that I can change anyone's mind or make the weapons disappear. I do it basically for myself because I cannot not do it and uh, be myself. I can't truly be be. Uh, uh, honest uh, with myself if I don't speak up and stand there, you know, uh, I, uh, and do it nonviolently and do it, uh, um, uh, you know, with a, with a, with a sense of uh, uh, self-effacement, you know. Uh, and so that's, what, that's basically what my mission has been, is to uh, stand there uh, when I'm asked to uh, participate in a social justice uh, issue, whether it's, uh, as I say, nuclearism or homelessness or uh, immigration or uh, uh, any one of the issues that we're confronted with these days, and to uh, speak truth to power, to do it nonviolently, and to, and to actually do it joyfully as well. Mm. Well, what, what exactly then, let's get down to the roots, from a basis of spirituality, how do you define that, Martin, uh, 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 as just a standalone definition, but also in relationship to the world and your place in it? Well, uh, you know, uh, our nation uh, began a, 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 a terrible road to self-destruction uh, after the war when it began to arm to the teeth, you know, starting with the uh, atom bombs and moving to thermonuclear and, 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 uh, and a whole massive conglomeration of weapons and weapons delivery systems uh, that lasted all the way up into uh, the Reagan era. They still are in, in place today, you know. We have so many sophisticated systems and so many uh, weapons uh, to be delivered by them. Uh, that it's just mind-boggling the amount of weapons, the amount of money, the energy that is spent, the the risk to our our health and and uh, the uh, risk to destroying the planet. And we still stockpile these weapons, but we have reduced them uh, in large measure over the years. And just recently, you know, President Obama uh, uh, concluded a a uh, nuclear weapons reduction uh, treaty with the uh, with the, the Russians has not yet been fully uh, 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 ratified by the Congress but uh, but the, the basic plan has a reduction of the weapons but still in all uh, we have enough uh, 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 stockpiled nuclear weapons and delivery systems to destroy the world dozens and dozens and dozens of times. And we're just one nuclear nation of seven in the With world. With the press of a button. I mean, I don't know why we haven't had a nuclear war yet. America's still got 2,500 weapons on hair trigger alert that take 20 to yeah. 30 minutes to hit Russia. You know, yeah. New York City uh, is is targeted with 40 H-bombs from Russia and, and Washington 60. It's just all madness. But you didn't really get to the root of my question. What, how do you define 
your spirituality, Martin? What is spirituality to you? And then how is well, it applied uh, to the world? I'm, I can see yeah, you. Yeah. I, I, on this one issue alone, I feel that we have developed a new religion, a false idols in these weapons. And this, this, this religion is called nuclearism. We worship these weapons. We count on them for our safety, our defense, as it were. And they are false gods and they are a reflection of evil, and they rob the poor, and they endanger the world, and they foreclose the future. And so they are, uh, they have to be called what they are, and, uh, and they have to be, they have to be expelled from our, our uh, you know, our, our culture. And, you know, of course, that's a long and arduous journey, and it's not one that will happen in my lifetime. And maybe not even in my children's lifetime, but it has to begin somewhere. We have to put a name on these things. These are false gods. These are an invitation to total darkness. Doesn't it say in the Old Testament, thou shalt shalt not worship false gods? That's it. That's the whole point. That's yeah. exactly where so it is. So America's yeah. got two false gods, money and nuclear yeah. weapons. And I yeah. think the interesting thing is, as a doctor, I always want to know why, how. We, until Jonas Salk and Sabine discovered the polio virus, well, it was Sabine, we, we didn't know what caused it and we didn't know how to cure it. Yeah. Uh, when we found out what caused it or what we call the etiology, then we could proceed to cure it. Okay, so what is, this, what is the pathology, and I would say fairly specifically in some men's minds, that worship nuclearism, and I've been looking at this lately, it's fascinating. In the limbic system, in the, in the reptilian midbrain, two emotions release dopamine. Now, dopamine is a lovely feeling you get after an orgasm, that lovely, gorgeous feeling, and it, dopamine chemically resembles morphine or opium. And the two uh, instincts that, or feelings that trigger dopamine release in the male brain are violence and sex. Uh-huh. Isn't that interesting? Um, yeah. And I think that violence, I mean, the ultimate violence is is hydrogen explosions and blowing up the planet. Yeah. And uh -huh. I think some men get off on this. They trip on it. Yeah. They're, you know, they, there's a, a, a very uh, popular phrase uh, still to this day, you know, nuke them, bomb them into yeah. the Stone yeah. Age and yeah. so forth when we're talking about our enemies, you know. Mm. Yeah, but we're called to love our enemies, aren't we? But love thy so, enemies. And, we, and, then we, and then we still call ourselves yeah. a Christian nation. Yeah. I want to, I, you know, I just want, uh, th th you know, you're talking about uh, why uh, 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 this, why they exist in our culture yeah. and why does, you know, our leadership feel that we need them. It is a reflection of our paranoia, and it is also a reflection of our bankruptcy, you know, our moral bankruptcy. Yeah. And, and, and it goes hand in hand with the bankruptcy that these, Weapons have cost us. Yeah. You know, Reagan brought the Soviet Union to its knees by outspending them in the arms race. They couldn't keep up. That was a major uh, reason why the Soviet Union collapsed. And even Mikhail Gorbachev had confessed that. They couldn't keep up with the United States. And along that point, I want to make one uh, uh, a point that I, I, I understand that very few people are aware of, even and particularly in the United States, and it's a great shame. I was in England in 1986, in April of 1986. I was doing a play there. I was there for about six months. And during that time in April, uh, Chernobyl occurred. Mm. And I recall that it was discovered on uh, the first day of the week. And I believe it was either the Swiss. Um, no, Swedes. Or, uh, Swedish. The, Sweden, the, yeah, the, the, Sweden. Swedish, the Swedes yeah. thought it was them. They came in after the weekend and said, oh, my God, we've had a meltdown. And they checked, and of course it wasn't them. They discovered that it was uh, in Chernobyl, mm. so it belonged to the Soviets near Ukraine. And they immediately alerted the Soviets, and the Soviets said yes, and it happened either Friday night or Saturday morning. Now, as soon as the news got out to the world, and that was on Monday morning, I, I was in England at the time, as I say, and the cloud had already uh, 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 made its way over Western Europe. So uh, President Reagan was in Japan at the time at a conference. And when the news was uh, announced that Chernobyl had happened, he condemned the Soviets for 
knowing about it for the whole weekend and not saying anything. Well, in fact, the United States knew about it the instant it happened via spy satellite. Mm. They thought initially that it was an above-ground uh, test, which would have been uh, uh, against a nonproliferation uh, agreement. And so they thought, wait a minute, it's happening in a civilian area. It's in the middle of a city. It can't be above ground test. Mm. And so it proved to be a, 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 a power meltdown at a nuclear plant in a place called Chernobyl. Now, we knew 48 hours before the United States, uh, before, yeah, before the United States and the world uh, supposedly knew about it. The Soviets, of course, knew about it 48 hours before, and they kept their mouths shut about it. They were embarrassed and 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 in a great hurry to try and uh, 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 fix it and cover it up. There's no doubt or question about that. But what about the American response? Mm. And what about the American responsibility to have alerted the world? We didn't. Reagan kept it quiet, and he let the Soviets stew in it. And his crime was an equal measure to the Soviets' crime of keeping it quiet until the destruction yeah. had already uh made its way across the Western Europe and other parts of the world. So that's part of the nationalism uh, and the paranoia that controls uh, uh, governments when they're dealing with these uh, meltdowns and uh, these, uh, this out-of-control nuclearism. And I have a fear that the same thing, and you'll have to tell me because you're closer to Japan right now than we are, but, you know, it's off the front page, as we said earlier, and it's not even on the second or third pages. It's nowhere in our national press these days. We're getting absolutely nothing on what's happening at uh, Fukushima, uh, if that's the way you pronounce it there. And so we know that uh, there's no announcement that they've solved the problem or covered it up, but we're very wary of what's going on. And it is bringing to mind the awful situation that we went through with Chernobyl and the information or the lack of information surrounding it. So I just want to share that with you, that the Americans were just as responsible for keeping the news of Chernobyl out of the uh, uh, global uh, knowledge as much as the Soviets were. I'm interviewing Martin Sheehan, pre former president of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the former acting president now. Now, Martin, um, <clears throat> two things this brings to mind. One... You said we won't abolish nuclear weapons in your lifetime or, you know, maybe your children's. That's not true. You know, Reagan and Gorbachev met in Reykjavik in 1987, and over a weekend, two mere mortals almost agreed to abolish nuclear weapons. Between yes, in fact, countries. Reagan wanted to get rid of all of them. Oh, no, and Gorbachev yeah. did too, absolutely. Yeah. And they got stuck on Reagan's stupid notion of Star Wars, which Edward Teller introduced him to. Um, and so there is a precedent. We can. We can agree, you know, to abolish nuclear weapons. And in fact, when Clinton was elected, we handed him a mandate on a silver platter. Eighty percent of Americans wanted to get rid of nuclear weapons. He could have flown over in Air Force One to meet Boris Yeltsin, a really out-of-it alcoholic, totally compliant, and said, OK, Boris, here's a treaty. We're going to abolish nuclear weapons bilaterally, and we own 97% of all of them in the world, within five years. But Clinton was intimidated by the Pentagon. It smoked some dope. He hadn't gone to Vietnam. He didn't have any moral fibre or backbone. His legacy is that the weapons remain on hair-trigger alert in Russia and America, and we could be blown up tonight. That's number one. Number two, I want to say I, I met with Reagan in the White House for an hour and a quarter. I don't know if you know this. No, in, I didn't. No, well, I met his daughter, Patty, in the Playboy Mansion of all places. Um, Hugh Hefner was excerpting a book called With Enough Shovels about FEMA and how, you know, if there's a nuclear attack, you get out your trusty shovel and you yeah. dig a hole, you know, <laughs> six feet long and three feet. I remember that. And get yeah. in the hole and put two doors on top of it and yeah. and dirt and, and they, the guy says... And you'll be fine. The yeah. dirt that does it. Yeah, so I um, had to address a whole lot of film stars together with Paul Newman about this. I'd never met Paul. He's... Oh... And anyway, I went up and said hello, and he, he kissed my hand, with, and so I nearly fell at his feet because he's so <laughs> gorgeous. He and was a he, lovely guy. Oh, and then he, I gave him a talk, and this tall, willowy, dark-haired girl came up. She said, I think you're the only person on earth who can change my father's mind. Would you meet him? I said, sure, but, you know, I don't want me, Baker, or Diva there. I'll see him alone or not at all. So, 
She rang me and said, we've got an appointment at the end of his working day. And I said, what time is that? She said, 4 p.m. So that left me a bit bit bewildered. (laughs) So we got into, you know, the secret service cars and into the southern portico and the downstairs library in which there wasn't a book. He came sort of in all doddery, didn't know where to sit. I shook his hand and said, hello, Mr. President. So I showed him where to sit. And we embarked on an hour and a quarter long conversation. I had more time alone with him than any other person in his eight years of presidency. My he God. knew nothing. I'd just finished my book, Missile Envy, and I was just pouring with facts and figures. So everything he said, I'd stop him and correct him. And you know when he got anxious, he'd get a red flush on his cheek. Yes, so yes. then I held his hand to reassure him. So... Half the time I held his hand and quickly established a doctor-patient relationship with him. Oh, God love you. What an extraordinary story. I established his IQ to be about 100, which is average, and that takes in all the mentally retarded people, etc. And I came out saying that I thought he had impending Alzheimer's, so my diagnosis was correct. But it was the scariest thing, Martin. I mean... Uh, and and what I what I'm thinking as as I talk to you, um, can't you use your acting prowess and abilities and contacts to do a film about the present nuclear situation uh, and about America's role? And I mean, it could be a little bit satirical, which gets people involved. They love that. But you're so good, and you were once the acting president, and by God, does the world ever need to be woken up again? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, since 9-11, there's been a lot of talk about uh, what would happen if uh, any number of terrorist uh, terrorist cells around the country uh, and around the world were to get a hold of, uh, you know, either the material or a real uh, weapon. Or, or if they, or if they destroyed nuclear reactors, which are yes, sitting exactly. targets, and yeah. apparently Al Qaeda have said, and it was just yesterday it was announced that they'd killed Bin Laden. Yeah. That the Al Qaeda said if Osama was killed, um, that they would target nuclear reactors in America, and I wouldn't put it past them. No, they're, they're absolute lunatics. Yeah. Well. Yeah. But and America we're was lunatic. For having, the, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> for having most of them, I, I know what you mean. <laughs> I I want to say, have you ever watched Doc Martin, Martin Sheehan? Have you ever seen the the English film Doc Martin? No, I haven't. Oh, no. look, you've got to you've got to get it. Anyway, there's this English doctor, and uh, he's got out Aspergers, and he's very funny with his patients. Everyone loves him, but he they drive him crazy because he can't relate to anyone. And he's in love with this girl called Louise, who's a local school teacher. And she says, Martin. And every time I talk to you, I think, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> well, would you mind if I said hello uh, uh, vis-a-vis this interview to some friends in Australia? We'd, lo- we'd love that, Martin. Okay. Uh, I'll just give you a little backstory. My son and I, uh, that is Emilio, uh, were in Spain about a year and a half ago filming uh, a movie called The Way, which opens, incidentally, next Friday in the U.K. and Ireland, and later on here in the United States, and I hope you get it in Australia before the end of the year. We will. But at any rate, it's a story of a father and son on pilgrimage across the, uh, uh, the Pyrenees in France to northern Spain and all the way over to Galicia uh, on the pilgrimage of Santiago de Compostela. And while we were filming, uh, filming we met a, a couple from... Uh, I hope I pronounced this correctly, Van Nockburn, Victoria, Australia. Does that ring a bell in Victoria? No. B-A-N-N-O-C-K-B-U-R-N. Never heard of it, and I grew up in Victoria. Anyway, go on. Okay. Well, at any rate, uh, this lovely family were on pilgrimage. Uh, This uh, 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 husband and wife, uh, Gary and Libby Jusen, and uh, they had uh, a few years earlier lost their daughter, Melanie, in an accident. And they were making pilgrimage uh, in her honor, oh. and uh, they uh, we made, we we made contact in Santiago, and we stayed in touch ever since. And they have started a foundation in her name. It's the Melanie uh, Jusen uh, Foundation mm-hmm. uh, there, and they asked me to be a sponsor and uh, and, and uh, of patronage, mm-hmm. and uh, I've agreed to do that recently. 
And uh, so that's what's going on with them. And I just want to just remember them and say hello uh, vis-a-vis uh, you, Helen, and, uh, and I'm, I'm very grateful to you for that. Oh, that's very sweet of you, Martin Sheehan. How long did it, does it take to do the Campostello uh, pilgrimage? Well, it, it depends on how fit you are yeah. uh, and how long you... It is a, it is a distance of about 800 kilometers wow. from uh, the little village of saint jean pied de port in the Pyrenees mm. yeah. over to the first Spanish uh, city is Ons and Valles, mm. and then across uh, uh, the north of Spain all the way over you'd go through uh, Pamplona, uh, Burgos, León, and finally into Galicia mm. and to Sant, uh, Santiago, which is St. James, of course, where they believe the remains of the apostle are, are buried in that cathedral. And uh, so the 800 kilometers can usually be covered in uh, five to six weeks by uh, uh, normal standards, but someone my age, in my condition, I would say closer to uh, eight or nine weeks. And is it a wonderful experience? There's beautiful scenery and ancient... It's extraordinary, oh. because you're going to go across a uh, part of Spain that very few people know. Yeah. The only really known city along the route is Pamplona, and yeah. that's famous because of the running of the bulls of and all course. the lunatics that get in their way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all the crazy men with testosterone poisoning to their reptilian midbrains. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Well, you wanted to ask me about what motivates me, Martin Sheehan. Yes, because we were talking the other day, and you yeah. mentioned that you don't have a specific uh, religious no, affiliation. No. So tell me about yourself. What motivates you to well, to to speak truth to power and to stand against nuclear? Religion? I grew up with agnostic parents or atheist. I was a little girl and I used to dress myself up and go to Sunday school at various religions looking for God. But I often just found cruelty, so that didn't work. Uh-huh. Um, I was I've always been fascinated by physiology. If you drink water, where does the urine come from? You know what makes a <laughs> snail tick. Um, and when I entered medicine, I, I just absolutely love it. That That is my religion, the life process. Just, abs- But I've always been terrified of death because I had a near-death experience when I was 18 months and God, oh, Titus, you media. remember it? You yeah, I do, remember. I do. Because, you do? Yeah, because um, I was left in a cold home for two weeks while my mother, who is very pregnant, and my father went for a holiday and it was cold in Melbourne. And I got middle ear infection, and I remember being placed on a barouche and taken along and held down with two big arms covered with black hair and this <laughs> ghastly mask put on my face, breathing this awful stuff. It was either ether or chloroform. And I thought I was dying. And ever since then, I've been terrified of death. So I thought, well, I, w- I, w- I, I never studied in biology. I always came a hun- you know, got 100% because it's kind of me. But I thought if I did medicine, I could have more control over death. But, of course, I just got more differential diagnoses if I got a lump in my neck or something and I I could be dead in three weeks. That didn't help. But my religion, and and I took the Hippocratic Oath at 17, I guess that's like becoming a nun. I'm a (laughs) medical nun and I'm totally devoted uh, to, to medicine. That is my vocation. It's where I live. And, uh... And, and I I worship it. I worship the sanctity of life. And it's funny, the other day I live in a little fishing village in, in New South Wales and the stars are unbelievable. I went out one night and I looked up there and I thought, I'm part of that. And suddenly my fear of death went. I was part of that before I was conceived. I'm part of the whole constellation when I die. And I felt really good about that. But So what motivates me is the truth. In medicine, you're not scared of telling a patient the truth. I'm not courageous. I just speak truth. That's all. And these people who are in politics, they are scientifically and medically illiterate. How dare they be? They have their hands in the pockets of all the corporations who fund them. And I'm sick of it. I am here to save lives. I'm a conservative. I'm for conserving life on the planet. And so, therefore, I'm never scared. I've had eight death threats, and, in fact, you know, some were pretty serious, I think. 
Yes. But, you know, what's my life compared to maybe the only life in the whole universe? And certainly I'm prepared to die for that. And Martin Luther King said, if you don't, I'm paraphrasing it, if you don't have something worth dying for, you're not really living. Yes, he did say that, yes. Mm. And also the word we've learned from the gospel that Jesus tells us that God is worshipped in the truth. Oh, well, you know, I uh, Jesus, I mean, we're all sons and daughters of God, and he said that yes. too. I think he yes. was the greatest psychiatrist who ever lived. And talking, yes, he was. <laughs> talking in parables just causes people to remember his preaching down the ages. And so, and but a lot of the other prophets were great too. It's just that Jesus really clicked with people. Yeah, um, and it, it cost him something, you know. Well, he, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we can, all, we can you know, the value... It, 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 you know, it, sometimes what we believe or, and, and causes us to do things because of our belief that are risky. And yet, if our beliefs uh, are, have any value at all, they have to lead somewhere that is going to cost us something. Otherwise, we're left to question its value. Well, I think we're here to serve. And the greatest happiness I ever get is when I spend a whole day with my dying patients, helping them helping their siblings to adjust, marriage counselling their parents. I'm deeply hungry, terribly tired, and deeply fulfilled. Or when I give a lecture to 2,000 people and I know I've changed their lives that night. I yeah. say to my audiences, lift your souls, not your faces. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good for you. And, well, you've lifted your soul. Martin, I think we need to work together in the future. Okay, let's do that. So we've come to the end of our time. Uh, okay. And and thank you very much. But hang on the line for a second afterwards because I want to ask you a question. Okay. okay. Helen, thank you so much. Thank you, Martin. My guest today on If You Love This Planet was the actor and former acting president Martin Sheehan, film actor and political activist.